Hello everyone and thank you for joining. Before we go any further, I'm obliged to mention that this session will be recorded, uh, but if you can stay with us, the aim of today's webinar is to hear directly from the experts on how we can tackle the rising challenge of cargo fires with innovative technology. I should add the primary focus is shipboard technology for container ships, but due to the scale of the challenge, the various considerations and solutions looked at will often be relevant to other ship types and at times the wider supply chain. Next slide, please, Ella. My name is Nick Gross, and I work for Lloyd's Register, or LR, with responsibility for LR's strategic direction in the container ship segment, supporting a number of different initiatives, including the Cargo Fires and Loss Innovation Initiative, which we will hear more about shortly. For the agenda, we will first hear from my colleagues, Rich and Seb, who will provide a 10 to 15 minute rundown on what we've learned so far from the Cargo Fires Initiative, after which we will turn to our distinguished guest speakers for a panel discussion lasting approximately 40 minutes. We will then wrap up and finish within the hour. Just one last admin point, unfortunately, time won't allow, us, uh, allow for us to answer questions from the audience live during the webinar. But if you have any questions, then please write them in the chat box and we'll get back to you with a response over email as soon as possible. Right, Rich and Seb, over to you, please. Thanks, Nick. Hi there. Um, my name is Rich McLaughlin, uh, and I'm here to tell you a, a bit more about the Cargo Fire and Loss Innovation Initiative, specifically the work Safety Tech Accelerator is doing to help advance industry's understanding on the potential for early stage fire detection on ships. Um, and, and on this, I'm also joined by my colleague, Seb Corby, who's going to talk a little bit more about the technology aspects in more details shortly. So. To set the scene, right now, uh, container fires are happening at a reported rate of about one per week. And I'm sure that many of you on this call can recall recent high profile container fires at sea. We also within ports and terminals and the, within the wider supply chain. Um, there's clearly a need to take positive action on this. Uh, and that's precisely why this technology acceleration program has come into being. Um, put simply, our vision is to um, eliminate container and cargo contamination of the ocean by, um, by preventing large-scale cargo fire loss and damage at sea. Uh, and in doing so, this will ultimately enhance shipping's reputation as a safe, reliable, efficient and green link in the global supply chain. Is this vision ambitious and challenging? Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, and exactly the kind of thing we like to be involved in. Is it achievable? Again, we believe, uh, along with the initiative participants, that the answer to this is also yes, it is. Um, so a common question that we get um, about this work is if it's only applicable to containerized cargo. Uh, we, the initiative has actually been running for about a year, uh, but in reality, no, it's not. Um, there's tremendous importance and value of the work being done to other vessel types and indeed other use cases as we look to exploit technology applications. Um, and this also aligns with uh, increasing understanding in industry about particular cargo risks. Um, and yes, you've guessed it, I'm probably the first to raise the subject of lithium ion batteries and the carriage of electric vehicles. So, um, containers, uh, container fires. Uh, impact and causes. Um, this is the so what question, what difference does it make, who cares? Um, and I think to address that, I'd like to start by focusing on impact. Um, frankly, fire at sea is one of the worst things that can happen to a seafarer. And as every seafarer knows, a, a fire event is most likely to occur at the worst possible moment, late at night when everyone's tired and fatigued, in the worst sea state and weather, when critical equipment uh, fails, um, and at the point in the voyage when, when furthest from so shore support. The absolute worst thing, of course, about fire at sea is that there's nowhere to run. So if a fire is not detected, contained, and extinguished appropriately, there's a real risk of major consequential events resulting in the loss of lives, uh, property, and significant environmental impact. There are, of course, other secondary aspects, uh, such as the incredible financial loss 
and reputa reputational impact for shipping and cargo interests. For myself, and I'm certain this is echoed in our anchor partners' organisations, the potential human impact reminds the absolute so what. This provides the catalyst to drive the safety agenda forward and explaining why we're here today. In terms of the causes of cargo fires, we have to recognise and understand the processes and events that have led to a particular cargo being placed on board. It's widely recognised that many of these the causes of onboard container fires and indeed fires occurring elsewhere in the supply chain relate to activities or processes well removed from that transport segment in which the fire has occurred. Simply put, if goods are not correctly manufactured, inspected, declared, packaged, secured or shipped under the correct environmental conditions, there remains the potential for ignition of cargoes. At the same time, any significant cargo movement or resulting containment breach has the potential to create a fire event. This is, is connected to the, the cause of fires that may occur as a result of, of stack collapse. So, yes, it's a complex and multifaceted challenge. And in these opening remarks, we haven't even begun to think about solutionizing. Thankfully, industry is acting to address supply chain elements through training and awareness and risk analysis activities such as know your customer schemes. Cargo screening, screening using data analysis is also being used, looking for keywords in cargo declarations and utilizing AI applications to identify and flag high risk shipments. Add to this new industry guidelines and regulatory engagement um, to, count, to, to counter evolving cargo risks, shipping tracking technologies uh, and increasing cargo inspections. They're all targeted actions to positively reduce the potential for cargo fires. Will they have an effect? I sincerely hope so. And there have been encouraging indications of how cargo screening has helped to identify charcoal products, leading to a reduction in reported fire incidents for this specific cargo. Meantime, there continues to be a need to enhance the protection to shipboard personnel by preventing large scale fires. In terms of the opportunities to drive this positive change, this initiative is currently focused on technologies to advance onboard cargo monitoring capabilities and therefore benefit shipboard personnel and enhance safety. A significant opportunity to do so is through the understanding that sensor technology, including sensing methods, are rapidly evolving and advancing, whilst also at the same time becoming more affordable. We also understand that asset-based connectivity solutions are becoming more viable. Linking to this, of course, we're increasingly aware about the potential to utilize um, uh, increased bandwidths that are available to connect ship and shore. Taking a wider view, we also recognize how other safety critical industries are adopting technologies such as advanced sensors and industrial IoT solutions. The question is, how can we best make use of these opportunities within a very challenging maritime setting? Finally, by validating technology deployments in maritime, there is a very real opportunity to accelerate adoption through supportive regulation. Right now in this initiative, we're working on two aspects for early stage fire detection on container ships that address regulatory gaps and have the potential to enhance the safety of life at sea. By working collaboratively within an open innovation framework on safety, this initiative has already made a significant impact towards enhancing cargo monitoring and fire detection. We'll hear more about the technologies from SEB in a moment. Um, what I would like to finally highlight and key to this success has been the experience sharing, expertise and direction setting from the anchor partners. And we would, have liked, we would of course like to thank all of those involved for this. Ultimately, this collaborative approach is providing a unified understanding of the issues and best approaches to them in terms of industry practice and technology deployment. The other key element here has come through our engagement with technology ecosystems and of course the technology companies themselves who've risen to the developed technology briefs and onboard challenges. Their input has also been critical in creating positive impact. So, um, I think that's enough for me for now, and I'll hand over to Seb to talk about some of the technologies we've been working with. Thank you.
So sorry, we can't hear you. No. Back now. Yes, we've got you now. Apologies for that. I think I know what went wrong. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. I'll start again. Um, yeah, we're at a really interesting point um, in terms of kind of technology uh, coming into play. I think we all know that sensors and IoT and probably even AI has, has been around in different forms for probably the last 10 to 15 years. Um, but we're starting to kind of see it become much more useful and have a lot more potential. So one of the reasons we've done cargo fires now is that testing all of this technology is high risk. Uh, we don't necessarily know whether it's going to work. Um, so collaborating together, addressing especially safety issues together means that you know we, we as a program can get a lot more done if we're all uh, agreeing our challenges, sharing our knowledge around testing different technologies. Um, next slide, please, Ella. Uh, so, yeah, we've, we started, so we're looking at the challenge here of early fire detection in the cargo hold. What we do with the program is we break down the overall picture of cargo fires and loss into individual challenges that can be tackled um, by different technologies. So the first one that we tackled was early fire detection in the hold. And we did a pretty broad market scan. Um, we looked at research, we looked at best practice. There's obviously a lot of reports that have been produced from Lash Fire and other things. So we did a really broad sweep of the technology out there. We also looked at technology from other industries. Um, often, I think in maritime, what we probably need to do is look at um, other industrial environments with a probably got bigger R&D budgets and think, okay, how are these guys tackling the problem? And can we bring anything in uh, uh, from their industry? So we started by ruling out certain technologies and firstly, distributed wired smoke detection systems. Um, as those of you who work on ships will know, one of the things we're trying to tackle here is actually a pretty old school uh, smoke aspiration system that draws smoke from the cargo hold into a centralized system and uses light to detect whether there's particles of smoke in it. So firstly, smoke detection, we've got big question marks around, is this even gonna be faster than the existing method? And then a wired system. Again, those of you who work on ships are gonna know, uh, 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 wires around the ship is gonna cause a lot of difficulty in implementing. So we kind of ruled that out. We also ruled out optical beam smoke detectors. Um, again, really interesting technology, fires a, a blade of light from a transmitter to a receiver and then back again and detects uh, how much that laser and how much that light has been interrupted by particles in the air. Extremely useful in certain industrial contexts, but not so much on ships, requires a lot of calibration. We looked at linear heat detection and there's a lot of different types of linear heat detection that we can look at. So. We'll talk about some that made it into the program, but others that didn't. Again, melting polymer, this is linear heat cables that, that degrade on contract with heat. Again, not gonna be that useful on a ship if you can't use it twice. Um, pneumatic, uh, and then analog, which is your original copper wire linear heat detection. Really cheap and great in large open expanses and possibly factory floors. But on a ship, we need really specific spatial resolution. So we need to know, is it that container or is it another container next to it? So analog doesn't provide the adequate spatial resolution we need. We also looked at non-infrared video detection. And for this challenge in particular, again, um, it's a combination of obviously in a hole, you've got a lack of line of sight. And as well, uh, it's a low light condition. So we removed non-infrared video technology. And then the final one, 
We also looked at really advanced smart materials, which again is more of a kind of research based uh, area. Uh, we looked at pretty much all of the available research around graphene, uh, graphene paint, graphene smart materials. Really interesting tech. Um, the, uh, the, the, the substance is able to detect really, really minute changes to heat. However, it's just not quite there. And there's a number of reasons uh, why it's not there. Again, it's only been tested in uh, proximity with extremely high temperatures. We're looking at really, really minimal um, changes to heat um, and, and issues around repairability. So I'll start off by kind of showing you what we removed and we'll then move into looking at what made it into the program. So eight technologies made it in. Um, this was past our pitching event. So what we do is we pull together the key technologies and we pull together key suppliers and vendors that we feel can actually deliver products and services into, into this challenge. And we also made a bit of a distinction here. So the reality is that all of these uh, companies are pretty much using AI. All of them are using pretty innovative uh, IoT networks and, and really, uh, really innovative kind of comms protocols. But some of them are more in a research uh, uh, phase and some of them are actually applied in industry. So we made that distinction. So the applied technologies there are technologies that um, we feel and we've, we've got credibility Maybe not in maritime. Maybe it's been proven in you know another sector, but it's been it's been demonstrated. It's been shown to be capable of doing what we need. And then we found three really interesting disruptor technologies. So using Wi-Fi signals to detect uh, minute changes to to cargo, both from a temperature, pressure, movement perspective. Um, using distributed infrared lens sensors. So this is not a new technology in terms of infrared lenses, but actually it's been uh, uh, industrialized and minimized to the point where you can fit it on a small chip. And now suddenly you could be looking at an infrared lens rather than temperature probe. And the other final one that we'll, we'll talk about is nanotube e-noses, e which are a really revolutionary uh, way of looking at molecules within the air versus traditional, traditional gas sensing. Uh, technologies. So what we do is we bring these technologies into the program and we need to answer key questions around them. Um, sometimes these questions can be answered through really, really good discussions between the vendors and, the, and, and our anchor partners. Sometimes we need to conduct feasibility studies, ship visits, you know, exploring how would you put these sensors on a ship, how much would it cost? Where would you put them? Uh, we also do laboratory experiments. So sometimes the questions we want to know about these technologies are solved through uh, really, really tightly defined experiments that we deliver in labs around the world. We have relationships with different fire labs. Um, and obviously the ultimate goal here is actually onboard ship pilots. So some of these technologies make it far enough that they actually deploy on a ship and we, we, we conduct journeys, we monitor the performance and credibility of the technology on ship. And, and being able to do that, being able to have those conversations and that collaboration between your tech companies, your anchor partners, uh, rather than having a transactional conversation around, you know, how many lengths of fiber optic and this is how much it's going to cost. And, someone demanding performance, you've got a completely different atmosphere where people are kind of collaborating to get confidence in the technology. Um, and our anchor partners are fully involved in designing the experiments, designing the feasibilities and the pilots um, and demanding what they need from the, the vendors. So I'm probably, probably over time already, but fiber optic very quickly. Really interesting technology. Some of you will be aware of it. It's a legacy technology, which means it's that the core hardware has been around for a long time, but it's now being combined with advanced artificial intelligence to give us a really, really interesting uh, technology where um, uh, the, the, the light that transitions through the cable 
is able to detect really, really small changes to temperature. We think there's a lot of promise here, and it's something that we're going to be trialing in the program. We've already delivered uh, a number of studies around it. Um, big questions for, the, for us are, it's extremely hardware intensive. So if you're a ship owner and you're looking at retrofit versus new build, something that requires that level of, if, if 30 to 40% of your cost is actually installing the tech, then the, the, the cost benefit is gonna be very different if you're looking at something at scale in your new build portfolio versus retrofit. So that's something that we're exploring, that cost benefit angle. Um, it's actually proven, it's proven in a laboratory context in terms of the cable's ability to detect uh, temperature changes. It's absolutely proven in other industrial scenarios. So the key for marine is, can you install it effectively? Is it gonna obstruct cargo? Is it gonna be damaged by the nature of loading and unloading? Um, and again, the big question is less around the core hardware and more around whether you can find a vendor who can utilize AI effectively to rule out um, uh, uh, events that you don't care about. Um, and you know, as with all of these things, the big question is, is the, the, the cable needs to be, have a, be in a close proximity to a container, which then needs to heat up from the inside. And by the time that a container is heated up, the steel of the container is then radiating enough heat that the cable can detect it. Should we be looking at a different technology? Those are the questions that we're, we're looking at. Um, next slide, please. So gas sensing in e-noses, really, really interesting for us. So you've got gas, really traditional gas sensing where you have a module, it hasn't really, uh, you know, hasn't necessarily been innovated on that much over the last hundred years, detecting specific gas um, gases. You've got traditional companies who are use, who've got really great modules. You've also started to see the IoT market minimize that technology and, and, and start to have it out to kind of um, integrators, but what we're looking at is um, uh, carbon nanotube e-noses, which uh, uh, ingest molecules from the air, regardless of what they are. Um, it could be anything. It could be it could be your garden. It could be a factory. It's it's absolutely on your ship. It could be um, it could be heavy fuel oil. It could be the breakdown of an EV. It could be the early signs of a smoldering fire. And what the carbon nanotube does is develop a signature of that, that event in the air, and it can remember that signature through AI and then start to identify that signature elsewhere. So we're taking the risk analysis a lot more proactively. So one of the things that we're looking at is um, what are the molecular signatures of EVs breaking down? What are the molecular signatures of spillages of risky chemicals that can lead to fires. And early, uh, early uh, uh, laboratory experiments have been incredibly promising. Um, you know, we're looking at orders of magnitude faster and more sensitive than smoke detectors and traditional gas sensors. So um, this is certainly something that we're gonna be addressing in a big way in year two, and, and you'll probably, probably hear more about it. Uh, next slide. Um, IoT air temperature probes, this is probably what a lot of people imagine to be your kind of your typical IoT um, uh, temperature monitoring setup. Uh, it's obviously far from typical. Big questions are, well, one of the things we've seen here, which makes it really viable, is that the cost of sensors has come down dramatically over the last 10 years. And suddenly you're getting really, really good sensors. They're really small. They're in robust shells. They're able to withstand the environment. Um, but a big question for Marine, and something that we're going to start looking at in year two of the program is what's the right networking infrastructure? We still haven't cracked in maritime. Um, there's a number of different comms protocols uh, from you know, 4G to Wi-Fi to uh, LoRaWAN. There's a lot of different comms protocols, and we need to work out what that balance is between these different, uh, these different protocols that would enable you to have your high bandwidth internet alongside your really, really low bandwidth sensors that are just 
pinging off a couple of bytes every few minutes. So something that something the program is actually going to look at is is what's that? What's the nature of that comms? That ideal comms uh, infrastructure. Um, but we feel there's a lot of promise here. We've done fluid dynamics modeling, and we think you can probably get away with one sensor, maybe two to four containers. Um, but you know, as with anything else, we're waiting for the container to heat up, radiate enough uh, heat, and, and then trigger the sensor. So we, we need to work out um, you know, whether that's really viable. Next slide. So the final one I'll talk about. I haven't talked about everything we're doing. We've got we've got an awful lot of work going on in the program, but the final one that's very disruptive is looking at setting up a Wi-Fi network on the ship, observing the change in um, the change in nature of the radio wave between transmitters and receivers, and in doing so, being able to detect really really small changes to to really anything that happens within within that environment and we've shown that it's it's just as able to detect changes to temperature as a temperature probe so we've run a number of proof of concept experiments where a temperature probe is positioned alongside this network um, and this this starts to become a really really broad broad discussion because we know that wi-fi is being looked at or uh, on land, that land-based industrial monitoring, looking at you know the movement of people, um, definitely looking at risk events. So this is a really early stage piece of work that the project's looking at, but it's proven really promising so far. So we're going to move towards a ship deployment, making sure that we can actually generate a, a capable signal around the ship. Um, but again, it's a legacy technology. Wi-Fi is not not new. The key is using AI to interpret um, whether there's a small small change to the small disruption to the signal and how do we how do we understand that as the event that we're interested in versus an event that we're not, for example, a container being heated up or, or loaded on and off. Um, so yeah, I mean any questions after this, you know, we we're open to questions after the webinar sadly not during um, but there's a lot of work going on here um, obviously the real detail is for the for the partners involved but again it's um we're all kind of striving to make marine industry safer so if you have ideas if you're interested by any of the stuff we're doing please get in contact all right um, yeah i think well we've still got this slide I think one final thing that we've learned is that it's awfully expensive for a single organization to test any one of these technologies on their own. It takes a lot of risk, it takes a lot of resource um, and a lot of coordination. And what we're finding is that the, the hypothesis that you know what, if you come together, you can you can do 10 times the amount is absolutely true. Um, our partners, the anchor partners, get to benefit not only from stuff they deploy, but they, they're fully involved in a wide range of technology projects. And I think that the idea around collaboration is, is really the only way forward when we're at this, at this uh, juncture. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Seb. Thank you, Rich. Uh, and Seb, I'm glad it was you that had the comms issue because it's always someone. So if it wasn't you, it would have been me. Uh, can I ask all the panelists now just to turn on their video? Turn on their camera. So moving on to the panel, we are honored to be joined today by a number of guest speakers, all of whom are involved with the Cargo Fires and Loss Initiative in some capacity. So as a quick introduction, before we dive into the discussion, we are fortunate to be joined today by Captain YS, Head of Operations from Evergreen, Mike Yarwood, Managing Director at TT Club, uh, Victor, who is CEO of Smart Nanotubes, Sven, who is CEO of ScanReach, and last but not least, my colleague Seb, who manages the Cargo Fires project from LR's Safety Tech Accelerator. Thank you all for being with us today. 
So starting with the vessel operator standpoint, Captain YS, uh, if I could start with you, without sharing any sensitive information, please could you share some insights on which innovative onboard technologies you are currently reviewing? Uh, yes, we are currently reviewing several options, uh, but uh, I think one of the most we are most interested in is the TIC, the thermal infrared camera. And actually now we have some portable TICs already sending on board for testing. Uh, what we feel is that the infrared camera can be a very useful tool in this regard, fire detection, I mean. Okay, thanks, YS. Um, that's that's very interesting. Uh, and I sort of building on to that, you know, as we look at investing in any new technology, there's always a degree of risk. Um, so can I ask about the proof of concept? How does that process look like in your mind? How should it be managed? And also, how does that compare to the approach adopted by the Cargo Fires Initiative? Yeah, for this question, I have a short answer. How we manage it, we give it to safety tech accelerate. That's, that's the purpose of why we join this uh, initiative. Uh, well, uh, well, honestly, as an uh, Asian carrier, I think compared with our European uh, counterparts, we are more conservative. So adopting any new te technology would be uh, can be a challenge internally. So that's why we see the CFLII is a very good opportunity for us. And Nick, I could just come in on the, th on the thermal cameras. Um, it, I just talked about it getting ruled out for cargo holds, but actually the second challenge we're doing is on deck and suddenly thermal cameras become really, really interesting. Um, there's still a lot of, we've got a lack of understanding around kind of how many, where should they be positioned? Um, you know, what's a feasible, If you, imagine if you kind of want to do it for under 100K per ship, realistically, because cost is always a driver here, what's what's the optimum layout um, and how high a resolution do the cameras need to be. Um, so we're, we're doing a study looking at what that optimum thermal camera layout is on, on the deck. Um, but there's also big questions around, I mean, um, false positives is often raised by the anchor partners because we know that in a maritime or any operational context, if you're being bombarded by alerts that are not useful, that's really game over for the tech. So the capability for the, any company to actually remove false positives from that thermal image through artificial intelligence is just as important as the hardware. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting uh, work stream that we've got over the next few months. Brilliant, thank you, Seb, and thanks, YS. That's nice to hear. I wasn't actually angling for a sort of shout out to the Cargo Fires Initiative, but that's great to hear. So thank you for that. Um, turning now to Sven, hello. Uh, may I ask you to give a brief description of how ScanReach has interacted so far with the Cargo Fires initiative? And more broadly, how you think AI will help with early detection of cargo fires on board? Sure, absolutely. Um, thanks, Nick. And, and thanks for um, having us here on the panel and for everybody dialing in. Um, we at ScanReach, uh, Scandinavian Reach Technologies, we um, build a resilient and robust mesh network for ships, and it's agnostic at both ends. So we're open to reel in any type of sensor data and push it out into any type of software or platform that's desirable to work with the data. And that platform can be AI or machine learning powered. I think what Seb also mentioned here, and we're looking at camera technology, and we're looking also at nanotubes, new technology, e-noses. What it comes down to in shipping is to combine all these sensors to a good data foundation that you can then apply your AI or machine learning mechanisms to. And that's the role we play in all of this. Um, I, I, could, I could make this very boring and say we're just a network, but when we're looking at digitalization in shipping, uh, we need to take a pragmatic approach at the same time. It's about costs, it's about convenience, yet it's still about safety, cybersecurity, and all these things. So the mesh networks that we're creating, they're run on a proprietary protocol, they're built for a steel environment, purposely built for the marine environment. Um, 
you cannot engage with it as a crew member so it's cyber secure in the sense that it reels in the data from let it be a camera let it be a temperature tag let it be a humidity sensor let it be a pressure sensor and it moves that data um, via api into a data pool um, where other experts in the industry and that's why i really appreciate about the accelerator can work with the data and apply their smarts um, to this. So I think what this accelerator enables us to do here is to get everybody around the table, somebody with a shipping and maritime expertise who says, I have a cargo hold, I have cargo, and it is challenging. We have steel boxes, we have challenges with perhaps misdeclared cargo, lithium batteries, packing practices, and so on. And we have then a common sense approach of applying new technology, resilient technology, purpose-built technology that then allows other experts to reel in and solve the problem. Uh, and that's certainly uh, unique in, in the industry, I'd say. Thank you, Sven. Uh, I mean, AI is obviously a very, a very much an emerging technology. And um, I suppose I just wanted to ask off the back of your response there in terms of maintenance, you know, what's the fail safe if something isn't, isn't functioning as it should be? Who, who is able to maintain it? It's not the crew on board, or is that something which has still been panned out? So to when I, can, when I can talk about our mesh network, the beauty of having a mesh network in comparison to let's say cable, the old fashioned way, is that first of all, you don't have a single point of failure. You can monitor the mesh network uh, on site, you can monitor it remotely, you can see where and how the data is moving. Um, and should any of the nodes, um, tiny little blocks that sit within the network that exchange data with one another, should those nodes fail, the system has self-healing properties and reconnects with one another. Um, and it keeps sending updates, versions, and this is the beauty of the digital world. We, we can basically tap into every element of it and see its health status down to the, let's say, ambient temperature around um, each of the nodes. And that allows you to build highly resilient networks um, across industrial sites. And uh, that's not necessarily unique to shipping. These are practices that you can take, let's say from the oil and gas industry, or even from land-based warehouse facilities, just take those practices to the marine environment. And uh, you can basically tell the entire industry, here's something that has been used in other transportation industries that is fail safe, that works, and that gives you now the opportunity to make use of modern technology, industrial IoT sensors that are readily available in the open market. And that's how to counter this. Um, um, the concerns around digitization or the concerns about new tech. Um, our mesh networks, for instance, can be installed by the crew itself and can be maintained uh, to some level uh, by the crew itself. So um, that's, uh, I think, how we can take the fear of the unknown away a little bit. Just on that point, I like, quickly, we, we hear feedback from the industry sometimes that, you know, with the influx of new technology, the skills that are required by onboard engineers and electricians are going to be different. So sometimes, you know, you might have one ship where someone is just really up to speed, absolutely loves it, and is, is keen to get involved in learning how to install and maintain an IoT network. But on another ship, you may have a completely different um, set of people who are less confident in doing that. And it's definitely something that we see in the, in the maritime industry is that you, you need to make sure you've got the skills on board to keep any uh, network resilient or through repair. Um, yeah. Thanks, Seb. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a real concern, the human element. And we'll have a few questions uh, on that later. But thank you, Sven. You know, obviously, AI is a massive prospect for industry, for, for society, and in particular, in this case, maritime. Um, but Mike, turning to you now, if I may, from an insurer's standpoint, are you able to share some insight on the environmental and broader financial implications of cargo fire incidents on board? as well as the frequency of these events? Yeah, sure. So I think Rich articulated at the very outset the, the alarming frequency of these incidents. So I think Rich mentioned one, one a week on average. I think our data suggests sort of one a month on average, but obviously we don't have access to all. Um, and of course, it's worth probably mentioning that not all fires in, in that context are equal in measure. We have smaller incidents that, are, that the crew are able to manage on board and, and contain 
right the way through to the most catastrophic incidents where we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars, unfortunately. But I think the important thing to highlight in this context and in the context of this discussion is that each and every one of those fires has the, the potential to develop into one of those more catastrophic losses without early detection, trained firefighting and, and equipment to firefight. And I think for us, in addition to the actual damage of the cargo, damage to the, the container, damage to the ship, there are a couple of other really important factors, I think, that need to be um, considered here. I think one's already been um, brought up, the crew, obviously crew welfare. Unfortunately, in some of the more catastrophic losses over the last years that we've all have heard of, we've got crew injury, worse still, fatalities on board. And, and it was touched upon earlier on, but the mental health aspect, I think, is a really critical one as we move forward here as well. You know, how does that impact your willingness and ability to continue doing that job, like you said, in an isolated environment at sea? So crew welfare, I think, is a, a, and protection is vitally important here. Um, and the other aspect you mentioned around um, the environment and the, and the impact there, I think, is a really, really interesting one as well. And it, I think as every global uh, business in the supply chain and beyond, you know, even those people that have goods going through the supply chain, all start their respective journey to net zero. I think there is a real tangible environmental impact to these incidents. Um, of course, it's perfectly possible nowadays to calculate the carbon footprint for a, a ship in a 20-foot container from any two given ports around the world. But what happens if the cargo within that container does catch fire? You know, at, at the very best outcome, we have a delay to the voyage, so increased emissions through through the, the voyage, damage to the cargo in the container that will need to be remanufactured and reshipped again, which doubles up. You know, um, dam uh, sorry, disposal of the, the damaged cargo and container potentially at, at destination. But in the more serious incidents, the carbon footprint for everybody on board potentially has the you know the potential to to sort of be much much greater. And again, I, th I think again, just bringing the, the the answer back to the the reason we're all here. I think against any of those important factors, it's absolutely vital that we strive. Um, through initiatives such as, as this cargo fire and loss initiative towards the development of new technologies to assist particularly in early detection, uh, but also then in firefighting capabilities on board when these incidents do occur. No, brilliant, Mike, thank Mike, you. And sorry, sorry to interject here, Mike, I think that is so vital. I mean, talking about uh, crew and safety at sea, um, and also the obviously the value of the cargo and that should in itself already suffice. Um, I'm surprised that it, right now in shipping we always have to find a segue into decarbonization in order to be heard or seen. And but but this year is actually it's about fire and keeping the people safe. Of course, there's an environmental impact, but it's really about the vessel itself, the safety of crew and cargo that should be the focus of all of this um, essentially. Thanks, Sven, and thank you, Mike. Yeah, some very interesting points there. I mean, clearly, the the threat to human life is paramount, um, but also raising the environmental implications is vital. And and really, it's not just safety, and it's certainly not just business. It's not just financial that we care about. It's the impact that we're having, um, and the responsibility we have to you know as stakeholders in the global supply chain to making sure that we have a a responsibility to to the global environment. I mean, I'm sure we're all aware of so many instances where it's gone wrong. I'm aware of a number of uh, different stakeholders or anchor partners from this initiative who actually list their participation on this initiative in their sustainability report. So I think cargo fires and the, the fallout of that is, is sort of well documented as being part of the sustainability story. Um, Victor, hello. Turning now to you, if I may, uh, please could you share a brief description of how your technology can help reduce the risk of cargo fires on board. Thank you, Nick, and thank everybody to uh, join this webinar. Um, actually, I can just summarize it very shortly, taking into account the time left. Uh, what we can do with our technology, we can win time. In uh, fighting the fire, this is probably the most important. Um, fire doesn't break up immediately in the whole ship. It starts at some point, it develops, and it takes time all, all the time. And we believe that electronic nose technology really detects as much earlier than other possible technologies. 
we detect molecules. So there are no smoke particles yet in the air. There is no maybe overheating which can be detected from outside container, but there is definitely a smell. Uh, let me just give you a, a good example, which I learned from one of Anka partners. It's another good thing that you can learn a lot from in this uh, initiative from stakeholders. So he brought such an example. So once at the ship, uh, early in the morning, one crew member was walking on the deck and just sniffed uh, fire smell. It was nothing seen, no smoke, no fire, but just smell. And actually at that moment, they still could uh, have time to localize which container was guilty, where the fire started, and they had measures to, to, to fight. And there was no major uh, disaster on the ship. So this is our ambition here with electronic nose because it will work simply like human nose. So I don't like really um, comparison to gas sensor. This is not gas sensor. Really. This is really an electronic nose and with very high sensitivity. So we really have ambition to prevent uh, fires so that we can detect so early, independent of which fire it is, uh, so early stage then um, there is still measure to localize container, to uh, to stop uh, development of the fire and there will be no disaster. This is really uh, a great opportunity, I would say, uh, to bring something uh, valuable in this uh, segment So from us and I'm really uh, pleased to be here. Uh, just maybe more, one more example, what we did test, so just to, to give you an overview. We already tested, for instance, uh, the off -gazing, detection of off from lithium-ion batteries. And we show that we can detect this off gazing, the smell specific to off gazing before the thermal runaway starts 20 minutes in advance. So this gives you already sufficient time before you even can detect any smoke or fire or temperature rise. Another example, a charcoal. So that we did together here with uh, Anka partners. So we had or have already a prototype which we tested and benchmarked uh, with smoke detectors. There is no smoke actually. So when charcoal is starting burning, overheats, then even glue, even you see fire, but you don't see any smoke. And fire and uh, smoke detectors detect nothing. But we detect the smells associated with starting burning of charcoal already well, well in advance. So maybe, I don't know, we didn't, uh, of course, have a real experiments to say that an hour in advance or something like that. So, and another good example that this technology can be easily extended to detect speedages on the cargo. So it's also another source of danger on the ship. And uh, as we have a platform technology which can be tuned to detect, uh, recognize any smell, so we can also address this trouble. So. Thank you, Victor. Yeah, it's, a, it's an exciting, uh, definitely an innovative te technology and one which we're uh, which we're seeing some really good sort of progress on in terms of the feasibility and the adoption with uh, as part of the cargo fires initiative. So, you know, thank you for that. Um, we've spoken uh, obviously a lot about new technology and the growing th threat of cargo fires from almost a process business and, and environmental perspective. But um, but we've also talked about the human element and how that's vital. Uh, Captain YS, turning again to you, if I may, as an ex-seafarer and someone close to the sort of beating heart of shipping operations. Please, could you share some insight on how the crew view the risk of cargo fires on board and possible solutions in terms of what sort of misgivings or concerns do they have about having to deal with new technologies on board? Uh, and how can we best protect them? What can we do to best protect them without creating extra headache or workload for them? Yeah, thank you for the question, Nick. Uh... Before I answer the question, I would like to echo uh, what Mike and Sven just said. The human element, the safety of the seafarers should be the priority. Uh, that's how we feel. The most important thing is not the cargo fire, but the safety of the crew. Then back to your question. Uh, uh, what, what was the question, please? This is wanting to see it through the seafarer or the crew's eyes. So they have this growing risk of cargo fires, oh. which obviously could result in in loss of life but also the potential misgivings they may have or concerns they may have about the owner of the ship planting more technology more devices on board the ship which can for us humans sometimes create a headache or extra workload so how you know how do we therefore you know who are sitting back here trying to sort of 
work out a solution for this? How do we see it through their eyes? How do we protect them whilst also making sure we don't create extra extra workload for them? Yeah. Well, speak on behalf of a seafarer. Uh, what we feel we have a sense of urgency about how we should do better in uh, in dealing with the container fire. When we see the, the volumes of the dangerous goods, it is increased uh, dramatically. For taking the uh, Asia Europe trade as an example, we see that increase up to 8% uh, for the Asia to Europe trade. The, that 8% represent 2,000 tubes uh, dangerous goods. So that's a lot. And when we see what we have on board the ships, I mean, the firefighting equipment, firefighting facility, the, the uh, firefighting uh, training to the crew, we are uh, kind of worry actually as a seafarers. So uh, what we are expecting uh, is anything that could help a seafarer to deal with the growing threat, uh, including the new technology like uh, mesh, like uh, uh, the, the, the snail, uh, sorry, the, the e-notes. That is, that are all very, very uh, interesting. We are hoping that as a seafarer, we are hoping the shipping company can give us something better to dealing with the real risk, which mm -hmm. is keep. Yeah, Nick, I, I, can I just answer that very quickly? I think, especially with some of the technologies that we're looking at, so, um, you know, CCTV, and machine vision, which is detecting faces possibly and, and human risks, um, especially with wearables that are tracking location. Like the idea of privacy and getting the confidence of the crew is the be all and end all of making it successful. Um, there's no silver bullet. I mean, for one, we have to have the crew on board buying into the solution from the beginning, can't be placed upon them they kind of almost need to be demanding it and, and when we look at deploying technology one of the one of the key i guess gateway criteria that we have when we look at sh uh, pilots on ships is is the crew is the captain are the people that are going to be implementing this and using it are they demanding it because it could be the most valuable solution it could be the could be doable but if the crew and the users aren't demanding it it won't be successful so bringing them on the journey right from the beginning making sure that you are tidy around privacy security demonstrating the value to the crew making them really clear that this is a benefit to them is it kind of all has to be done and i think probably it's just looking at uh, industrial um iot more generally there's probably we've probably been guilty as an industry of kind of telling people that this is a new innovation this is good go and use it versus you you actually need to be involved in designing it um so yeah it's it's, yeah. it's part of the learnings that we take as well in the program Seb, just to add add to this is uh, that's that's a little bit of our bread and butter um so our brand emerged from uh, working close with the wind energy sector and providing walk to work solutions um, so this means that um, crew members are wearing a wearable that is detectable within the wireless network. Um, it does increase safety, but we actually have people devoted in our customer success team just to train the crews and work with the organizations, all GDPR compliant, of course. But you need to go that extra mile so that everybody feels comfortable with the technology so that it becomes just like your hard hat and your boots. It just becomes another element that protects you uh, during your shift and uh, you know where you're, where you're being seen by the network and you know uh, where you're not being seen. Um, there are certain rules around that as well. Of course, you know, you're not tracking in private quarters and these type of things, but it, it adds a level of safety uh, one of our partners in Canada, Seacoast uh, Marine, they are working closely with the Canadian firefighting forces, and making sure that you know these incidents are better taken care of. You can find um, victims um, in, in 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 a foggy or smoky area quicker um, due to the location management solutions, and it does make a massive impact. It's 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 hugely beneficial, but it's uh, again it's new tech. And it's something that touches 
not only the vessel but the policies and procedures of the entire organization and that needs to be uh, considered just as much as what we're doing here as part of the accelerator when we're talking about fire risk it requires experts from all angles and it's more than just putting a new camera system on board of the vessel there's a whole process a policy associated to it who looks at the data who reports out on the alarms what do we do in in terms of false positives and i think that's that's a, those are the great learnings of this group here say how do we deal with those situations so that we have a comprehensive solution that we can deploy to the wider industry at the end okay guys thank you very much we're running very low on time here but uh, it's frustrating because there's a lot more questions to ask i'm going to try and squeeze two in very quickly um and just as a wrap up to that yes obviously it's vital and it's a, it's nice to hear that you know we are talking about bringing the crew uh on board through the decision making process and not just simply presenting them with a solution saying this will be good for you so that's great um victor just quickly what, what are the key barriers to adopting innovative tech into maritime that you've encountered um, and what can be done do you think to accelerate this adoption process uh, of tech such as yours by vessel owners and other stakeholders? Yeah, well, that's a good question. So of course, when we, we don't come from maritime uh, parts, so for us were of course several, or well, even many open questions, how we should deploy the technology, what is expected and what can be, of course, uh, disturbing effects. And all this we learn from our uh, partners, which are in the round or from Accelerator itself. And uh, I think we, we will sharpen our technology this way that addressing also a topic which was discussed that it will be, become hidden. So it will not uh, add any additional trouble a lot on the crew, but it will help to, to feel themselves secure, to uh, get uh, warned in time. So this should be the goal actually of development of such technology for the ship cargo ships. Thank you, Victor. And thank you so much to the panelists today. Uh, there are many more questions I would like to ask, but unfortunately time is against us. Mike, thank you. Seb, Victor, Sven, and of course, Captain YS, really appreciate your time. Uh, Seb as well. Let's turn off our cameras now. We're gonna hand over to Rich for the final wrap up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick, and a really great informative session. Thank you again to all the panel members for their contributions. <clears throat> I think in closing, I'd just like to highlight how this Cargo Fire and Loss Innovation Initiative is now reaching out, as we've talked to here in this webinar, to other maritime and supply chain stakeholders in thinking about these emerging technologies and their deployment. Um, and clearly, there are trans, uh, transferable applications. This work, uh, uh, you know, of what the activities that we're doing to other ship types, such as the PCTC uh, and the Ropax vessels, and we're certainly keen to support that segment in in approaching uh, fire detection uh, in particular. Um, and I think we we touched here on the the wider supply chain and on the understanding that prevention is certainly better than cure in this case um, we're also looking to involve wider supply chain stakeholders such as ports and terminals uh, logistic companies insurers cargo owners um, to reduce that potential for cargo fires uh, in the supply chain and on ships so um, if you'd like to know more uh, and potentially about how you could be involved uh, to drive this change through technology if you're a technology company um, as well, um, please get in touch with us. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, contact details are here and are, of course on our, our website. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to bring the webinar to a close uh, and thank you very much for, for listening and paying attention. Uh, have a very good day. <laughs>